that have joined, you will not see hundreds of little boxes of people popping up in their living rooms. You are all muted, so you can't be seen or heard by anyone else taking part in this webinar. If I hand over to Raj, if we start. Thank you very much, Joe, and um, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the Five Stone Buildings webinar program. Uh, my name is Raj Arumagam, and today I'll be talking about the sorts of issues which will arise when a trust is terminated. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Adam Cole, who's a partner at Walker's over in Guernsey. He's going to share some uh, valuable perspectives from Guernsey, which, dare I say, English courts might think about adopting at some point in the future. Um, now, just, just a few housekeeping points, um, uh, which, which Joe may have mentioned. Um, first, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A box. Uh, please uh, feel free to use this if you've got any questions during the webinar. We will try to answer some of the questions at the end if, uh, if time permits. Um, secondly, I must uh, to remind you, as Joe has mentioned, that the webinar is being recorded. So if you don't want to be identified when asking your question, uh, please tick the anonymous box when entering your question. Um, and a copy of the recording will be available to view uh, at your convenience on our website shortly after this webinar finishes. Um, to get the best view of the webinar, um, we would recommend you watch in speaker view rather than gallery view on Zoom. And finally, if you have any questions after the webinar has taken place, uh, please don't hesitate to contact either Adam or me. Our email addresses appear on the final slide. Uh, and you can also contact me through my clerks, whose details are on the Five Stone Buildings website, along with details of all our previous and our upcoming webinars. Uh, Joe, thank you. So we wanted to talk today about the sorts of issues which are likely to arise and which need to be considered by trustees when a trust comes to an end. Uh, just, just to get started, it might be helpful to remind ourselves of perhaps an obvious point, which is how does a trust come to an end? Well, without giving an exhausted list, there are three common reasons why a trust might terminate. The most common situation is where the trust no longer has any assets. Uh, typically, this will come about because the trustees have transferred the assets to beneficiaries. And the trustees might do this either under the terms of the trust. Uh, so, for example, uh, say a life tenant with an interest in possession dies and the remainder men under the terms of the trust become absolutely entitled to capital. Um, or the trustees might decide to exercise their power of appointment or advancement and so distribute all the trust's assets to objects of the trust. Um, another probably less common situation is termination of the trust as a result of variation by the court under the Variation of Trusts Act 1958. And um, another reason is the application of the principle in Saunders and Vautier. Uh, so all the beneficiaries who are all of full age and capacity uh, effectively terminate the trust by requiring the trustee to transfer the trust property to themselves or at their direction. Now that is uh, the, it's the, uh, the first of the issues I'll be dealing with um, in a bit more detail with Adam later on in this talk. Uh, Jill, please, thank you. So I've set out uh, on this slide some of the key issues which need to be addressed uh, by the trustees to a greater or lesser extent, depending upon the circumstances when a trust is to be wound up. Now, now of course, this is not an exhaustive list, uh, but it covers the main issues. Um, now, before I get into the nub of these issues, uh, which arise when a termination is, is properly afoot, I wanted to discuss, uh, as I mentioned on the previous slide, one of the ways in which termination can be brought about, which is by the beneficiaries uh, under the principle in Saunders and Bautier. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, now, I'm sure you're all very familiar with the rule in Saunders and Bautier decision from 1841, uh, 
The starting point, of course, is that in the ordinary course, so without reverting to court, beneficiaries cannot compel the trustees to act or deprive them of their discretion. But if all the beneficiaries are of full age and capacity, and the trustee is uncooperative, then they can, if they act together, terminate the trust by requiring the trustee to transfer trust property either to themselves or as they direct. So effectively, the beneficiaries acting together can authorise and require the trustees to depart from the terms of the trust. Thank you, Joe. Now, uh, if that principle is successfully invoked, then the trustees cannot override the beneficiary's wishes, even if the trustees consider it to be in the best interests of the beneficiaries to do so. And in the case of Hughes and Bourne from 2012, what happened was the trustees applied to court for directions as to whether or not to sell the main asset of the trust, which was a 51% controlling shareholding in a family company which published local newspapers. Now the trustees received an offer which they considered was exceptionally favourable and um, uh, that was particularly in light of uh, what was then a challenging market for local newspapers. I don't think the market's got any better since then and it was their view that this would benefit all beneficiaries. Now the group of beneficiaries who were beneficially entitled to the shares which were to be sold said no um, and, and upon the trustees application, the court ordered that the trustees could not sell those shares if the beneficiaries could take advantage of the principle in Saunders and Vautier. Um, uh, thank you, Joe. So, so, so far, so clear. Um, but we then have something of a difficult question, which is how do you apply the Saunders principle to discretionary trusts where the class of beneficiaries is not closed and where potential beneficiaries might not yet even be in existence and could be remote? Well, the answer as far as English law is concerned is set out in the decision um, of the High Court back in 2009 in um, HMRC in Thorpe. Now, in that case, Mr. Thorpe was the sole director of a company and a trustee of its pension scheme. Now, on the slide, you can see um, uh, the, the, the key rule from the scheme rules, uh, which was, was uh, interpreted in this case. Um, it provided the scheme shall provide any or all of the following benefits. In the event of the death of the member whilst in the employ of the employer, a lump sum, a pension payable to the member, a pension payable to a widow or dependent in the event of the member's death, and a pension payable to the widow and or dependent of the member in the event of his death. Now, um, Mr. Thorpe and his wife were the only employees of the company and they were the only members of the scheme. After Mr. Thorpe's wife died, Mr. Thorpe became the only member. Uh, now, the pension scheme was treated by HMRC as an exempt approved scheme. Um, I, I don't propose to go into the, into the detailed tax aspects of it, um, but on the basis that he was, he said, the sole beneficiary of the scheme, Mr. Thorpe directed the trustees of the pension scheme to transfer the scheme's funds to him. And he relied upon the principal in Saunders and Vautier. So he took out the, the funds, which were something in the region of 200, 250,000 pounds. But he didn't include those funds in, uh, in his income tax return. HMRC got wind of this and withdrew their approval of the scheme and assessed Mr. Thorpe to tax. Now, Mr. Mr. Thorpe appealed and the matter came before the special commissioners and they held or decided that Mr. Thorpe could not rely on the rule in Saunders and Vautier because of the possibility that other beneficiaries might come into existence. Now, that, that decision of the special commissioners was appealed to the High Court and the High Court uh, upheld that part of the Special Commission's decision. Um, Joe, could we have the next slide, please? And what the Special, well, what the special Commission has said, which the High Court approved, was uh, the appellant accepted that there was a theoretical possibility 
that he might remarry or that he might have dependents within the meaning of the rules of the scheme. However, he argued there was no practical possibility of any appointment being made in favor of such a person because any person that he might take, would, any pension he might take would exhaust the fund. And the court said, in, or the, the commissioner said, in my judgment, that is not sufficient. There remained the possibility that persons other than the appellant might be entitled to an interest under the terms of the scheme. And so the um, uh, commissioners and the court uh, um, held that uh, Mr. Thorpe fell outside the principle in Saunders and Bautier. So the position um, is, uh, in England, is as set out in this case, uh, the rule in Saunders and Bautier doesn't apply where there are potential beneficiaries not yet in existence, however remote their interests might be, or however unlikely it might be that those beneficiaries should come into existence. Um, in that case, there was the possibility that persons other than the applicant might be entitled to an interest uh, under the trusts uh, in that uh, of the scheme. Um, uh, so, so Saunders and Vautier in that case didn't, didn't apply, it was effectively distinguished by the judge. Um, and uh, in short, the decision means that English law requires a firmly closed class of beneficiaries. All beneficiaries really does mean all beneficiaries in England uh, for Saunders and Vautier to apply. Now, with that, I'm going to pass over to Adam. Uh, who's going to talk about a decision in Guernsey called Rosnano, which makes an interesting counterpoint to Thorpe. Adam. Thanks, Raj, and good afternoon, everyone from Guernsey. Um, as Raj said, I'm Adam Cole, and I'm a partner in the Insolvency and Dispute Resolution partner, uh, Department at Walkers in Guernsey. I have a keen interest in contentious and semi-contentious trust matters. Um, thanks very much, Raj and Firestone Buildings, for giving me a chance to talk briefly today about the Guernsey case of Rosnano. Mollard and Pulbra. It's a case which came before the Guernsey, Guernsey Court of First Instance, also known as the Royal Court, in early 2019, and then was appealed up and was heard by the Guernsey Court of Appeal with a decision handed down at the end of 2019. It's a case in which Walker's acted, and with apologies for giving the game away so early, it's one in which my partner Rupert Morris was instructed by the successful applicant beneficiary. Now, the concept of trusts is an English import into Guernsey law, and as such, the starting position following the Guernsey Court of Appeal Authority that you can see on the slide there is that the usual incidents under English law are also to be adopted with regard to Guernsey trust law, unless or until they're inconsistent with some provision of Guernsey customary or statute law, or are otherwise inapposite or inapplicable. Now, the Rosnano case is a classic example where the construction of the Guernsey statute leads to a different approach to that which Raj has just helpfully outlined in the earlier part of this talk. The background to this case is the establishment of the RN Pharma Trust, Guernsey Law Trust, that was at the heart of the matter. Um, none, none of that was really an issue, but the arguments before the court were more around the construction of the, the statute and we can therefore summarise the, the facts quite succinctly. In brief, Rosnano, which was a Swiss company, formed part of a group whose ultimate parent was a Russian state-owned entity. The purpose of the group was to invest in nanotechnology, and ultimately a transaction was undertaken whereby shares in a UK PLC company were ultimately held through the trust. The trust was drafted as a purpose trust until such time as it had beneficiaries, and thereafter it was a fairly straightforward discretionary trust. At all times, Rosnano was listed as the sole current beneficiary of the trust, and therefore the purpose elements were largely irrelevant. The appointer in this case was Pulbra, and it had the power to add beneficiaries, but it had never actually exercised that power. Now in due course, liquidators were appointed to Rosnano, and they sought to terminate the trust on the basis that Rosnano was the sole beneficiary, and therefore had the requisite power to do so, under section 53, subsection three of Guernsey's trust law of 2007. As you can see on the slide there, that provides that without prejudice to the powers of the Royal Court under subsection four, which I'll come and speak about a little bit later, and notwithstanding the terms of the trust, where all the beneficiaries are in existence and have been ascertained, and none is a minor or person under legal disability, they may require the trustees to terminate the trust and to distribute the property among them. 
Now, Rosnano's efforts to terminate the trust were opposed by Mollard as trustee and Pulbra, as I said, as the appointer and also the enforcer on the basis that section 53, subsection three of the trust's law was a mere codification of the rule in Saunders and Vautier. That line was pushed by the respondents following an earlier Guernsey decision and also a Jersey decision, um, which indicated that that was the intention of the section. Now, as we'll see, the statute set out quite a different position and therefore the attempt to lay a gloss over what the statute says with regard to English law was unsuccessful. Mollard and Paulbra argued that section 53.3, in light of what's said in Saunders and Vautier, could only be engaged where all the persons entitled absolutely and indefeasibly under a trust to, whole of, to the whole of the income and the capital of the trust property had been ascertained and were sui juris. They took the view that the respondent was merely the sole current member of the discretionary class of beneficiaries. And because there was power to add to the beneficial class, it meant that the class was not closed and would therefore not meet the rule that Raj has outlined. Rosnano, on the other hand, contended that the power to add did not alter who was entitled to the due administration of the trust, and that those who could be added to the beneficial class were not beneficiaries unless or until the power was actually exercised in their favour. The case, as I said, proceeded as one of construction, and the court considered the manner in which the term beneficiary was defined elsewhere within the statute. Section 80, subsection 1, which you'll be able to see on the slide, was particularly apposite in that it defined a beneficiary as a person entitled to benefit under a trust or in whose favour a power to distribute trust property may be exercised. Noting that Rosnano clearly filled that criteria, the court addressed what it saw as the key question, namely whether or not there was any other person who satisfied the de definition as a beneficiary and who was already in existence and ascertained. The court came to the conclusion that Rosnano was the only such beneficiary, stating that just because there is a real possibility that the power to appoint beneficiaries might be exercised, it does not follow that anyone who Paul Brough, being the appointer, had in mind was a beneficiary for the purposes of the 2007 trust law. This accorded with the decision of the Royal Court in Jersey in reacts to settlement. Again, relevant passage there is, is highlighted on the slide for you. In that case, it was observed that there was a clear distinction between a beneficiary of a discretionary trust, being a person in whose favour a discretion to distribute income or capital of a trust may be exercised, and a person who is a possible object of a power to our beneficiaries, that is, one who is not in fact a beneficiary, unless or until the power is exercised in his favour, and he is so added. Put another way, the court could not identify any other beneficiary who could have refused to join with Rosnano in requiring the termination of the trust, and who could thus have defeated Rosnano's application. The application to terminate the trust was therefore granted on these bases. The decision was appealed by Mollard and Pulbra, but the Guernsey Court of Appeal upheld the aspects dealing with section 53, subsection three that I've just been speaking about. The Court of Appeal did, however, remit an unresolved section of the application, the section 53, subsection four part of that, back to the Royal Court. If you could just turn the slide over, I think, please, Joe. So section 53, four, which is set out there, affords the Royal Court a discretion to override the right of termination conferred on beneficiaries under subsection three. This aspect has not yet come on before the Royal Court, and it'll be interested to see whether, and if so, to what extent, the Royal Court is willing to utilise its discretion to salvage the presumed or reduced intentions behind a Red Cross Trust. For those who haven't come across Red Cross Trusts before, they are discretionary trusts set up with a single charitable beneficiary, but where there's an expectation that the power to add beneficiaries will be exercised to introduce intended beneficiaries, someone such as the settlers family members at a future point in time. They're not, in my experience, as common as either Mollard or Pulbra sought to argue before the Guernsey courts, and there may be little appetite for the courts to look for reasons to uphold them in the face of anything other than perhaps the most truly egregious attempts by aggressive default beneficiaries to terminate in advance of an exercise of powers to add beneficiaries. Certainly, the Court of Appeal accepted that the certainty afforded by Section 53, Subsection 3 of the Trust Law could bring negative consequences for these types of trusts. It seemingly had little sympathy with the notion that it was an unwelcome outcome. 
and you'll see there the points that are made, which is that we, being the court, are not necessarily too discouraged at the possible effect of Section 53.3. We question whether Red Cross trusts were as common nowadays as they perhaps once were, and whether they are to be encouraged in an in international finance centre such as Guernsey, with a high reputation for upholding international standards. There are though, as many of you will be aware, legitimate reasons for seeking to maintain privacy. And this leads into considerations about the extent to which practical steps beyond the timely exercise of a power to add could also be relevant to mitigating the vulnerability of non-Red Cross trusts to premature termination. Discretionary trusts could, for example, be drafted such that the beneficiaries are expressed to be the children and remoter issue of the settlor. Such trusts would not then be affected until there was no possibility of any remoter issue being born in the future. The decision also highlights risks for non-Red Cross trusts where beneficiaries are described as, for example, my wife X and my children A, B and C. Following the decision in Rosnano, one can now readily see the potential for such trust to be terminated by a unanimous demand from X, the wife, and A, B and C, the children, notwithstanding any intention to exercise the power to add, say, grandchildren as beneficiaries at some stage in the future. Whilst the risks of early termination may be readily mitigated by effective drafting, I would suggest that those who advise on international trust structures want to consider carefully the risks, particularly given the outcome in Rosnano and the similarities between the Guernsey statute and the provisions that can be found in the statutes of other offshore jurisdictions. I'll hand back to you at that point, Raj. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, so where does that leave us then? Um, how does Rosnano affect English law? Well, it's, it's clear that um, Thorpe represents English law um, and Saunders and Vautier will not apply if any potential benefit is not yet in existence. But I think that both Thorpe and Rosnano can be criticised to some extent. Um, I think Thorpe uh, might be said to be excessively rigid and might be unrealistic or seen as unrealistic in some cases, um, um, for example, where the potential class of beneficiaries is exceptionally remote. Um, in Thorpe itself, it was always a, a possibility that uh, Mr. Thorpe, Thorpe could remarry. It's hardly, hardly uh, unheard of, so um, notwithstanding his age. So, so one can easily imagine situations where there's, there's a far more remote um, possibility. Um, on the other hand, Rosnano, um, I think, could be criticised as giving perhaps far too much flexibility uh, to the Saunders principle. And my view is that there's scope for argument to uh, possibly slightly soften the Thorpe approach in an appropriate case um, with sufficient merits. So I say watch this space. Jill, thank you. So with, with that, we go back to our issues arising on termination. Um, and I wanted to look at some of these in a bit more detail. So the, the seven issues I, I identified were, um, should the trustees try to prevent the trust from ending? Um, it's important to check, obviously, the trustees' powers if they are exercising a power to bring the trust to an end. Um, thirdly, the, the question of who's receiving the trust assets. Uh, just making sure that they're entitled to and their identity. Fourthly, tax consequences, which is often vital. Um, fifthly, and, and the main point I wanted to address was protecting trustees after termination by way of indemnities and liens. Um, sixthly, sixthly, the distribution documentation and the importance of getting that right. Um, I, I, I won't address that because that's 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 probably. Um, um, something trustees will be very familiar with anyway. And then finally, trust administration and uh, making the final accounts. And clearly um, it's important that the paperwork is, is in order um, and a final accounts are drawn up. And again, I won't be um, addressing that. Um, so just going through the, uh, these first five, then uh, Joe, please, thank you. So the first issue, uh, preventing a trust from ending. Well, this may seem unusual, uh, but in some cases, the trustees might well consider it is not in the best interests of the beneficiaries for a trust to end. 
So for example, if a beneficiary becomes entitled to capital at say the age of 18, the trustees might believe that the beneficiary is not mature enough to manage that uh, in his or her own best interests. Now, if that's the case, there are a few options the trustees might consider. The first is whether they have the power to defer the beneficiary's entitlement, either under the trust deed or using the statutory power under Section 32 of the Trustee Act 1925. Um, in relation to um, uh, uh, relatively recently, that used to be only 50% um, um, of the entitlement that could be deferred, um, although now more recently it is, it is the full entitlement. Um, and what the trustees could do if they were deferring is, for example, they could create um, an interest in possession instead. Alternatively, the trustees might, um, if, if, if they don't uh, have uh, the power to vary the beneficiary's interest, they might see if they could vary the trust. Um, so that's, that's an issue which some beneficiaries, um, although they might be reluctant uh, to interfere with the trust uh, in, in this way, they might feel it's appropriate in an appropriate case to, to consider. Thank you, Joe. Uh, secondly, the second issue was uh, if the trustees are terminating the trust by exercising powers, uh, whether it's a power of appointment or a power of advancement, then it's obviously vitally important to double, and I would say triple check, the terms and scope of any power they're intending to rely upon. Uh, so does it authorize the action the trustees are taking? And, and certainly um, as lawyers and, and in particular at the bar, we see um, many, many cases, of course, where that's not happened um, and um, a trustee well advised uh, will, will, of course, be checking and rechecking the power and the terms in which it's drafted. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. Now, um, the third issue is the question of being sure who, or, or understanding exactly who's going to be receiving these trust assets uh, on termination. Um, again, uh, as ever, it's crucial to check the terms of the trust instrument, but also to check any related documents uh, to make sure the class of beneficiaries has been properly identified. So for example, has a power to add or remove beneficiaries been exercised, which should be taken into account uh, and clearly should not be overlooked. And it might indeed be appropriate to consult with beneficiaries and see if they have any preferences that can properly be taken into account. So if one of the beneficiaries uh, feels they do not need um, a distribution and it might be better given to another beneficiary, then that is something the trustees may well be able to take into account. And, and finally, it's obviously essential to check the identity of the beneficiaries. Um, in, in, in most cases, this will not be an issue. Uh, but clearly, in some cases where beneficiaries are scattered around the world, and that's, that's something which the trustees will need to take care of uh, dealing with. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. Um, I've uh, put tax consequences with very little underneath it, because um, in most trusts, tax consequences are a vital uh, consideration. There, there should have been a consideration of the tax position upon the establishment of the trust, and at appropriate intervals thereafter. Now, as we all appreciate, tax advice will often inform how and when a trust is terminated, um, and um, it, it, it plainly needs time uh, to be um, obtained uh, in, in most cases. So um, without saying more on that, I just highlight that as, of course, another area. Uh, I, was, I was involved in a case um, a few years ago and I want to mention who, was, who it was, but there was a trustee um, who was appointed uh, as trustee of an umbrella scheme. So uh, individual uh, workers uh, operated as um, uh, effective contractors under this umbrella scheme. And uh, the trustee was assured at the start by the settler that this scheme was all legit and had um, a tax clearance and wouldn't give rise to any liabilities. We rolled forward about three years and HMRC is knocking on the door and presented the, uh, the trust with a bill of, I think it was 30 million pounds. Um, now clearly the trustees are in uh, some quite significant difficulties at this point. 
um, and uh, it, it emphasizes quite vividly the importance of ensuring the tax position is uh, dealt with properly and professionally from an early stage. Next slide, please, Jim. So the main point I wanted to address or dwell on just for a moment is protecting trustees from liabilities after the trust has terminated. Now, as far as a trustee is concerned, personally, this is obviously one of the most important considerations to address carefully. And there are two key points to bear in mind. Um, there's a relationship between the trustee and third parties uh, with whom liabilities are incurred. And there's the relationship uh, between the trustee and beneficiaries to whom the trustee will be looking for an indemnity. Now, first, in relation to third parties with whom the trustee deals while administering the trust, these relationships expose the trustee to unlimited personal liability. This is because the trustee is acting as principal in those transactions with third parties. The trustee's exposure is therefore not limited to trust assets. And the Privy Council in the Investec Trust case, uh, in a different passage, slightly higher up uh, than 59B, um, said that although a trustee has duties specific to his status as such, when it comes to the consequences, English law does not distinguish between his personal and his fiduciary capacity. It follows that the trustee assumes those liabilities personally and without limit, thus engaging not only the trust assets, but his personal estate. Now this personal liability is why Mr. Justice Dankworth about five decades ago uh, once described being a trustee as an onerous and sometimes dangerous duty. Well, perhaps that's slightly overdramatic, but I think we, we get the point. And interestingly, in other jurisdictions such as Jersey and Guernsey, um, um, they, they do, or the, 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 the local trust law does to a significant extent recognise the distinction between a trustee's personal and his fiduciary capacities and limit a trustee's liability for acts done qua trustee uh, to trust assets as opposed to personal assets. Um, and then aside from the third parties, the second relationship is that between the trustee and beneficiaries. And the trustee has a right of indemnity in relation to liabilities incurred as a result of that first relationship. And this will depend, the right to the indemnity will depend upon the terms of the trust and the manner in which the trustee has administered the trust. Now the general rule was summarized by Lord Hodge um, in the Investec and Glenala case, uh, and the quotes up there on the screen, a trustee is entitled to procure debts properly incurred as trustee to be paid out of the trust estate, or if he pays it in the first instance from his own pocket, to be indemnified out of the trust estate. To secure his right of indemnity, the trustee has an equitable lien on the trust assets. Uh, Joe, next slide, please. So this general principle of indemnification um, was described in First National Trust Co and Page last year uh, in the High Court as um, an ancient, the trustee's ancient common law right of indemnity from the trust fund. And, and it is indeed very long standing, um, uh, said to be as old as, as, um, as trusts themselves, in fact. But it, it has a statutory footing um, in England uh, under Section 31 of the Trustee Act 2000. And you can see there in relation to administration expenses, um, a trustee A is entitled to be reimbursed from trust funds or B may pay out of the trust funds expenses properly incurred by him when acting on behalf of the trust. And the Court of Appeal in Price and Saundry in December of last year explained that this simply codified the common law position as it stood at the time of the enactment of the Trustee Act at 2000. Next, next slide, please, Joe. So equity confers an equitable interest in the trust fund to the trustee who has a right of indemnity against trust assets that equitable interest operates as a first charge or lien over the trust fund. And there's um, two points to note uh, here. The first is that the charge uh, takes priority over beneficiaries' claims. Um, that's uh, plainly, plainly good sense. Um, secondly, the right of indemnity uh, consists or comprises of four um, rights, one of reimbursement, exoneration, retention, 
and realization. Now, Section 31A codifies the right of reimbursement from the trust property. So the trustee pays the liability out of his or her own resources and then reimburses himself from trust property. And Section 31.1b codifies the right of exoneration. So the trustee discharges the liability directly from trust property without dipping into his or her own pocket. Um, next slide, please, Joe. But um, in relation to the right of retention, um, which is, of course, so important, um, there, there are five remarks I just wanted to make uh, regarding this equitable lien. Um, first of all, to the extent it's uh, um, dealing with present liabilities, or it's to secure present liabilities, then the lien is available to the extent needed for that purpose. And you can see that how long standing the principle is. Uh, secondly, um, in relation to contingent or future liabilities, um, the uh, lien is available to the extent required to meet the worst case on the basis of reasonable but not fanciful uh, assumptions. And in the Concord Trust and Lord Venture case in 2005, uh, Lord Scott in the House of Lords said, uh, paragraph 34, that the trustee uh, cannot reasonably insist on an indemnity to cover a contingent liability. And in that case, it was a, a negative outcome in litigation being uh, and, and ending up being liable for damages to another party and unless the risk of that happening is more than merely a fanciful one so it's it's um although it's a high burden it's not uh, necessarily an insurmountable one and thirdly there has to be uh, sh seen to be has to be shown to have been proper inquiries as to the contingent or future liabilities so a trustee who is um, seeking to um, rely upon an equitable lien for future liabilities uh, needs to have done their homework and be able to set it out um, in writing clearly if there's an application being made or if there's correspondence being sent. Fourthly, um, a helpful point which takes us back again to Saunders and Vautier is a beneficiary cannot compel a transfer of the trust fund uh, to a beneficiary who's become absolutely entitled to some or all of the trust property until the trustees, as it's described, just demands have been met. And that dates back to ex parte James in the early 19th century. And then finally, a very, very important point. If the trustee makes a distribution to beneficiaries, it is vitally important that the right to an indemnity is expressly preserved. If not, then it is possible that the right to an indemnity will have been lost. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. So um, practical steps to um, uh, protect a trustee. So if the trustees are going to part with trust assets, what, what can they do to protect themselves? Uh, well, there's a number of options available. We've discussed already retaining assets until liabilities have been provided for. Um, uh, one option is to delay taking action. So if, for example, uh, in the near future, a large dividend is about to come in on some shares. Um, uh, and so significant liabilities can be met in the near future. It might be possible to delay a distribution to beneficiaries, but obviously only if that is not contrary to the interests of the beneficiaries themselves. Um, I've mentioned the importance of preserving uh, expressly the lien on distributions, that's crucial. Um, contractual indemnities, well, the trustees uh, could ask for contractual indemnities from beneficiaries when transferring the assets, uh, which would mean that the beneficiaries would agree to compensate the trustees for claims, um, but usually only claims that the trustees uh, could have met from trust assets, and generally also excluding claims for breach of trust. Now, the advantage of that is that contractual indemnities are likely to be enforceable in jurisdictions which don't recognise trustees' equitable rights. Um, the problem is that trust uh, 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 beneficiaries have no obligation to give an indemnity. And in any event, they might not have enough assets to meet a trustee's claims. But it's one to consider. Um, the next one is limitation, a contractual limitation on liability. Well, when the trustees are contracting with third parties, they could include a contractual indemnity um, that limits their liability to the value of trust assets in their hands at a particular time. 
And of course, if they don't, they remain personally liable. Um, typically, other parties to the contracts who are being asked to sign off on uh, that, to include that kind of term, will uh, be looking for the trustees to arrange for future recipients of the assets to give back-to-back uh, -back, um, indemnities. So you end up with a, a series of a chain of indemnities, which can be very difficult to manage. And with any limitation of, uh, of liability, clearly the wording has to be clear. Uh, another option is to uh, see, try to get release from the beneficiaries and the trustees could try to protect themselves from a claim for breach of trust by obtaining a release from beneficiaries if they're adult and, and have capacity. Uh, but again, they're not obliged to give a release. It's quite unusual to get a general release. And um, uh, typically it would be in relation to a specific potential breach of trust, such as uh, making an investment at the beneficiary's request. Um, another option is to consider taking a charge of the property where that's uh, available and also insurance. Um, professional indemnity insurance may cover professional trustees against some risks. Um, uh, and um, for example, uh, uh, risks in relation to tax but generally it's impossible to pay insurance to deal with, uh, to cover a breach of trust, um, unless the trust document specifically allows that. Um, next slide, please, Joe. So just wrapping up there, um, in terms of concluding remarks, I suppose the main point to take away and for trustees to remember uh, to be doing is to be planning well ahead of termination and maintaining, of course, good records throughout. So for example, are there key dates to diarise and plan ahead, um, such as beneficiaries turning 18 or 21? Now, competent trust, professional trustees uh, can be expected to be doing this already, but you may find it helpful when speaking to trustees, or indeed if you're a trustee yourself, um, to consider how prepared the trustees are for termination in light of uh, the various matters um, which um, are um, set out above. Uh, Joe, just on to the final slide, please. And um, those are our, that's the end of our um, uh, webinar today. Just going to have a quick look and see if there's any questions. See, there are two questions here, which I'm going to put through an anonymous attendee. Um, the first is, I'm going to read this out, when terminating a trust by appointing the assets to the trust beneficiaries, some practitioners take the view that in order to ensure the trust is killed off, the trustees should, in addition to appointing out the assets, exercise their power under the deed to bring forward the end of the trust period, assuming they have that power, so the trust period ends immediately following the appointment of the assets. From a drafting perspective, it does make it clearer the trust is in fact terminated and prevents trust from being revived. Um, should further hands uh, for uh, assets fall into the hands of the trustees. What are your views on this drafting practice? Um, I have to say, I've not, I've not come across that myself, but it would seem to be a very sensible um, approach. If, if nothing else, it documents um, very clearly what the trustees have decided to do. Um, and um, it, can, it can only be um, a helpful thing. But again, of course, clearly the trustees would need to be checking um, their, the, 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 the underlying trust uh, document itself to see that they, they are entitled to to do that um, adam i don't think anything to add to that no i i would be inclined to agree with you raj i, yes. I think that sounds like a, a sensible step and and actually on the face of it hard hard to see any immediate downside to proceeding in that way yeah yeah and just one final question do beneficiaries have to sign the deed of appointment if it includes a lien over the assets being appointed. Well, that's interesting. Whether they need to sign it is one question, but it certainly would be good practice because in there you could include the acknowledgement that there is a lien and that would certainly strengthen um, the trustee's uh, position as regards the validity of their equitable lien. So I think it's, a, it's, it's actually a very good uh, additional drafting tip, which could easily have, fit, have fitted into um, the, the seminar today. Well, if there's no other questions, um, I think it just remains for me to thank Adam for very kindly um, helping out today and to thank all of you uh, for joining us. Um, there are um, other webinars uh, set out on our uh, website. I'd encourage you to have a look at that.
and we'll look forward to seeing you at another webinar very soon. So thank you very much and have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you, Raj. Thanks all. Thanks a lot.